Hello, fellow Couch Scouts. I'm Angel Hermes. For those of you who don't know me, I'm very honored to be doing this today as your resident Egyptologist. I've given you a link to 10 very basic lessons in hieroglyphs. I'll mention those in a bit. We are about to go on our journey to Egypt, and we all know that we enjoy our trips more if we know something about the place and the people before we get there. Egypt is the land of the pharaohs, mysteries, and treasure. But not all the treasures are gold or stuff you can sell on eBay. Many archaeologists, Egyptologists, and philologists, those are scholars who study many languages, feel the ancient writings are themselves a priceless treasure. In AD 391, the Byzantine emperor Theodosius I closed all pagan temples throughout the empire. This action terminated a 4,000-year-old tradition, and the message of the ancient Egyptian language was lost for 1,500 years. It was not until the Rosetta Stone was discovered in 1799 that the ancient Egyptians awoke from their long slumber. Today, by virtue of the vast quantity of their literature, we know more about Egyptian society than most other ancient cultures. The ancient Egyptians wrote in a strange-looking way. We call them hieroglyphs, not hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics is an adjective. The word comes from the ancient Greek meaning sacred carvings, sometimes called sacred writing. The oldest Egyptian hieroglyphs that have been found are from about 3400 to 3200 BCE. That was a long time ago, even before the Den Master was born. No indications have ever been found describing how they were taught. There are no text scrolls describing grammar. Writing is not just for writing cat mystery books, though we do love them. Writing helped the Egyptians do things like keep track of how many cows they had and how much grain they owed to the king. Scribes went to school to learn to read and write. It was a very important and respected profession. Good scribes sometimes went on to become high-ranking officials. Anyone could become a scribe. One other thing we don't know is how many others besides the scribes were able to read and write. We aren't even sure that kings could. There are two kinds of hieroglyphs. First, ideograms, sometimes called pictographs. They stand for what they are. A cat is a cat. And then there are phonograms. No, not those old record player thingies, whatever they were. But they represent sounds, like our letters do. And they can stand for one, two, or three consonants. Any glyph can be used as determinative. A determinative is a picture of an object which helps the reader. These are put at the end of a word. For example, if a word expressed an abstract idea, a picture of a roll of papyrus tied up and sealed was included to show that the meaning of the word could be expressed in writing, although not pictorially. Take cat. It is never written with just a picture of a cat. It is spelled out. But at the end, there will be a picture of a cat. And sometimes more than one determinative is used. For cat, there is often the glyph representing an animal skin and its tail. Not my favorite hieroglyph. To begin to translate something, I always start by writing the glyphs that I'm going to translate. Some cats don't, but I feel it helps to do it, and makes me feel a connection to the ancient Egyptians. On the line below the glyphs, I write the letters that have been assigned to those glyphs. This is called transliteration. The next step is to parse the sentence. This just means I break it down into the words, write the part of speech, and the definitions. English word order is subject-verb-object. Egyptian was verb-subject-object. I make a note if the word is V, S, or O. Then I try to put them in an order that makes sense in English. Then it's on to the next sentence. Flashcards are essential. Mama and I make our own. You can buy them at the Egyptologist Superstore, but writing them helps put the words into my head. We use blank 3x5 cards cut in half, 3 by 2 and a half. On one side, I draw the hieroglyph, and on the other side, I write the transliteration, the definition, and the part of speech. 
Mama and I quiz each other, and Chip is an excellent student of hieroglyphs. Hieroglyphs were written from right to left, left to right, and sometimes in columns that were read from top to bottom, never from the bottom up. So how do we know which way to read these funny-looking little pictures? This part is easy. Many of the hieroglyphs are animals and people. You can tell which way to start reading by looking at their faces. Just read toward the faces. Never sneak up behind a hieroglyph. In this example, you'll see the faces facing toward the left in example A. So you'll start on the left and read toward the faces. In example B, the birds are facing right. So you'll start on the right and move toward the left. Examples C and D are written with a vertical column orientation, so you'll start at the top and move down. Easy peasy. There are over 2,000 hieroglyphs, but most of them are only used maybe once. The ancient Egyptians, as far as we know, didn't put them in any particular order like our alphabet. What a mess that could be. So, when we learn to read them, the most commonly used glyphs were put into a specific order. You can see that in the lessons I gave you the link to. It's much easier if you have a hieroglyphic dictionary. You'll find a cheat sheet with the alphabet in the class materials, and a link to a hieroglyph typewriter you can use to turbocharge your hieroglyphic studies. You probably think you won't have time to do the 10 lessons before the trip, but they are easy. Any cat could do them with its tail tied behind its back. I strongly suggest that you look them through, especially lessons 1 and 2, which are the basics. Lesson six is about the royal titulary. You guys in the back, please stop giggling. It has nothing to do with boobage. It means the king's titles. He had five names. Lessons eight and nine are really good. They're about the names of the kings and what are known as the typical offering formulas. You will see these things carved and painted in the tombs. We will see. It is super cool to see them and actually know what they mean. If you want, you can copy some of it and keep the paper in your pocket to pull out when needed on our trip. What did the Egyptians write? Love poems, stories like the shipwrecked sailor, and all manner of things relating to business, including letters from the king to other countries. There are also medical papyri, with instructions about what to do in the case of medical emergencies. These were always followed with a magical spell, so even if the Egyptian didn't have health insurance, he'd have a way of getting healthy again. I think that would be the same as when we say a prayer. The Egyptians taught us that honey is bactericidal. Mama uses it. It's good stuff. I'm not that wild about it myself, since it turns my furs into a sticky, gooey mess. But if you are a sphinx cat, you probably can use it all you want. Oh, you've probably heard of the Book of the Dead. There wasn't one Book of the Dead. They were all similar, but not the same. It contained spells to help the deceased get to the afterlife, the duat, and then to be able to eat, and speak, etc. They were scrolls placed in the coffin with the deceased. This was expensive, but anyone who could afford one for their loved one could and did get one. So, get through as many of the lessons you can before our trip, and you'll be able to enjoy Egypt just like Cleopatra and King Tut. Thank you again for letting me talk to you about hieroglyphs. I love studying them. Please feel free to ask me any questions, and I will try my best to answer them. Let's all have a great time in Egypt. Remember to be extra careful to be on our best behavior. After all, cats were worshipped there. <laughs>